we are hit the go button. So hello and good evening. I have come online just a little bit early so that people get a chance to arrive to come and have a look to see what's going on. Hopefully everything is all working beautifully. We're just testing things and in about three minutes we should be able to start. Hello cheesy chum. <laughs> Hello again. Paul Drew, nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Love bug. Hello, thank you. Cyril Sieberhagen, sir. Good to see you. Your picture may show up in a minute. Hello, Pat Millett. Lovely people who've been on workshops. Look at this. Oliver Littler, Budet. Hi, hello. Alana, Phil, John Lambert. Wow, welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. How exciting. Hello, Jess Watson from Canada. How amazing. Look at all you lovely people showing up. Good to see you too, Cyril. <laughs> Hello, Emmeline Churcher. Emmeline Churcher is my awesome PA, for those of you who don't know. And of course, Melissa Fox uh, is my other awesome PA. Oh, but, oh Bartosz, nice to see you, sir. Um, there's a little bit of stuff you're going to recognize in here from when we were in Vietnam together. Um, hello, Kithy, Kathy, Ian Gogan. Hello, hello, hello. How could anything be complete without you, Ian Gogan? Ian has flown over from the States and spent time with me. He's also been in Iceland with me on workshops. Hello, Robin Millett. I have some stuff of yours. I hope you don't mind. I want to show people. So how exciting. Look at this. Ian Fox. Hello, Ian Fox. Kevin Peterson. Greetings from Wisconsin, indeed. How exciting. So what do we got? Another minute. We'll go live properly. Um... I am too kind, Ian, yes, and I know you well. <laughs> it's good to see you here. How exciting, seeing all these lovely faces showing up. Hello, John Lambert. Hello, Ashish Sharma. Graham saying hello to Melissa. I'm sure she's delighted. Melissa always likes to be mentioned. With good reason. I'm really lucky to have Melissa and Emma on board. They are completely awesome. I couldn't do what I do without them. They both go way above and beyond everything to help me make stuff happen. Hello, Rudy Martins. I haven't seen you since Lanzarote. Good to see you, sir. I hope you're well and happy. Oh, Will Smith. Hello, Will Smith. OK, what's the time? It is seven o'clock, so I'm going to have to stop the hellos and get on with it, I think. But it is really great to see you lovely people here. Thank you. Steve Ball. Yes, I remember you from Lanzarote. I hope you're well. Hassam Nurian, awesome man. I got some of your stuff I want to talk to people about. Good to see you. Hassam is a, a lovely guy, as all the people who've been on my workshops are. So what are we going to be doing tonight? Well, I have lots and lots of people ask me questions about workshops, what it's like to go on one. They, you know, rightly so, have concerns and all the rest of it. So I spoke to some of the lovely people who've been on workshops in the past and uh, they have kindly volunteered to come in and join the live chat tonight. So, you know, you may find some of these guys will be responding direct to you from their own experiences. It's not just me telling you what it's like to be on a workshop. You can actually discuss with people who've been on them for real. Some of these guys have been on several workshops over the years. Some will have been on, you know, the One Day Beginners course, which I run fairly local to my home. Some have been on more exotic ones. So, you know, it's uh, it's a really exciting evening. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but thank you so much, guys, for, for joining me. And thank you so much to you workshop people who've agreed to come on here and help me out. I love you all. So reasons to come on a workshop. Well, you know, obviously I want you to come on a workshop. It's part of what I do for a living, but it's also part of what I find totally exciting to go somewhere new, somewhere different, somewhere which we don't know what's going on. It gets the creative juices going. But most importantly for people coming on workshops, I would suggest it's in un un in I can't speak, uninterrupted time for you to dedicate to your photography because sometimes it can be really hard to fit life in around you know doing your photography and you know you guys have been on workshops please you know just post comment on what i'm saying as well from your own experience you may disagree um, but whatever you feel about that please 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 share it with everybody else um, but it is it, it, it's uninterrupted time where you can actually fill your brain with something um, 
and really concentrate on it. Because also, the other reason is we all learn by doing. It's all very well to watch things on YouTube and, you know, maybe wander around the garden, but, you know, how many times have you done that? Whereas if you're somewhere that's different and exciting, I would suggest you're far more likely to do. Plus, of course, the third reason, we all get inspired by each other, by seeing what each other photographer on a workshop has made and cooked up out of exactly the same ingredients. Uh, that you had yourself because we all see the world differently. This isn't about comparing, this is about seeing the world differently, seeing what happens, seeing what's going on, you know, from someone else's point of view. Um, those to me are the, the three main reasons. It gets the creative juices going, it gives you uninterrupted time to dedicate to doing something that you love um, with like-minded people and also of course you get inspired along the way. Now something I forgot to say a moment ago is I'm, as you notice, anyone who follows my live broadcasts, the location always changes, doesn't it? Because I don't have fast enough internet connection at home to do it. So I am actually in the home of my good friend, Mr. Simon Taplin's parents. Now, those of you who've been on any Asia workshop will recognize this man. Come and say hello. Hello viewers, <laughs> nice to join in. Uh, I'm here in the background answering questions. <laughs> Thanks Simon. Yeah, so his lovely parents have said, come on over and, you know, use our front room. So that's really nice. And Simon is a lovely bloke, an amazing photographer. I've got a weird echo going on in my live chat, and I think it's coming from something in here. Let me, no, that's turned off. That's Ah, oh, maybe it was yours. My, my oh, hands. sorry. Sorry about that, guys. Right. Back on topic. Lots of people are saying hello to you, Simon. <laughs> so, who comes on a workshop you know what kind of people come on a workshop this is something which i often get asked the questions range from things like what kind of people come you know what kind of skill level do i need what kind of equipment do i need what's it like what are the conditions like will i be lonely we're going to address those as we go but first off um so what kind of people come on a workshop well i can just show you some pictures and introduce you to a few you know so this is down on one of my one day beginners courses fairly recently some of the guys we like to try and get a bit of a group shot and share it around everyone because by the end of the day everybody's become pretty good friends as a rule this uh here's some of the guys uh i know some of you who are on the live are actually in this photo um by all means shout out and go that's me this was uh on lanzarote a couple of years ago um, Zurich, I think this was a couple of years ago too, you know. All sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life, of all sorts of age groups, etc. Come and join in on workshops. Here's Rohit out in Iceland. Here we have Mr. David Poxon, who I believe is here somewhere in the chat. Now, I don't know why it looks like he's peeling a banana, but actually whatever Dave Poxon does in life, he appears to be peeling a banana. Um, He's a lovely guy. Um, he lives on the island of Lanzarote. It's where I first met him when he came at a workshop there. And then he's been over to Iceland with us as well. Um, Janine, who's been over to Iceland. We've got Susie here again in Iceland. We've got a few in Iceland. Now this young fella here, Brooke, he's an extraordinary young guy. So he's a student. Now I realize that cost is a factor. It is an implication, you know, for people, particularly for coming somewhere like Iceland. Um, but Brooke is a student. He lives in Australia. He hasn't got much money. But he used a little bit of this and he got the cost sponsored. He managed to get a grant and a sponsorship to take himself across the other side of the world to come and shoot with us in Iceland, you know. I often find that if you want to do something, the problem isn't a lack of resources. It's usually a lack of resourcefulness to find a way. Because let's face it, we can usually find a way to do something if we really, really want to. Or if we're forced into it, if we really, really have to. But you know, Brooke's a great guy. We had a really good crack with him out in Australia, out in uh, Iceland. And back in Australia, he also then took his pictures, turned them into an exhibition. He's been selling pictures and doing all sorts of cool stuff. So if you're watching Brooke, it's, it's good to see you. Tim here has, is a veteran of many workshops. He's gonna be joining Simon and I in Cambodia and Vietnam in a, what, three weeks time? Three weeks time, isn't it, Simon? Uh, yeah, three weeks, three weeks time. time. Yeah, so that would be good. We've got the lovely Vanessa here. She comes out to Iceland. She's been on an Iceland workshop with us twice now with Thor and I. Um, she always says she comes to Iceland to warm up a bit because it's only about, what, minus five, minus six in Iceland. Whereas she says back home in Canada, it's around minus 25. 
This is Laurie. She came over from the USA to Cambodia. She's just showing some kids some pictures she's just shot of them because the people are really friendly. It's so easy. You may have heard earlier on I uh, said hello to a guy called Ian Gogan. <laughs> there you are, Ian. <laughs> that was in Iceland earlier on. Ian is a master of capturing a feeling of things. It's not so much he does shoot some beautiful pictures, but Ian is particularly skilled at capturing feelings of things. I haven't got the picture here, but he shot one out of the window of the bus as we were driving along one day, and it was kind of rainy, and there's all these raindrops on the window, and it, the weather had closed in for a little while. And it really was the feeling of being in this closed-in weather. It's good to see you, Ian, and thank you for joining, joining us here. I want to introduce you to Jens Koopman from Germany. He is there with my partner Thor. Thor's the one in blue. He can't help it. He is peculiar. Um, Jens is a really cool photographer. He's put together a couple of books, I know, from some of the shots he's taken on workshops. And uh, there's one or two of his shots coming up, actually, along the way. This guy's Jason. He was on Lanzarote with me earlier this year. Um, and a shout out to Mr. Cyril Sieberhagen, Dr. Cyril Sieberhagen, I should say. We were standing on top of, you know, a mountain, a volcano, and uh, at sunrise, this is C Cyril standing closest, looking in the back of his camera there. And this is what we were shooting, you know. There are some amazing locations, and as you can see, all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life, of all genders, creeds, etc., come on the workshops. And it's amazing how quickly a group will gel together and just become mates, a group of strangers. And I'm going to talk a little more about that in a moment. One of the most common questions is about skill level, you know? How good do I need to be? I'm probably not good enough to come on a workshop and it'll be a waste of time. Well, I mean, any of you guys who've been on a workshop who feel you were kind of far more down at the beginner end, particularly to begin with, you know, please, you know, share some of your experiences about that with the guys in, in the live chat. Because, you know, I, I've met some extraordinary people who have taken on the journey. Let me just introduce you to a couple more. This is Layla. She was in Vietnam with us last year. Um, and I'd say Layla has done a lot of photography around people. She loves photographing people, but she'd never really tackled it, you know, really, really going in deep with thinking about cameras and all the rest of it. So though she's not a complete beginner, she was when it came to sort of some aspects. Also, Layla had never done post-production. She arrived on the workshop with a new laptop. She'd just installed Lightroom. She'd never done it before. But, you know, with a bit of encouragement and a bit of coaching, she was coming up with some beautiful images. This is in a village, uh, a Hmong village in the mountains in uh, Vietnam. And uh, we have permission to go in. We can photograph anything we like. We can interact with the villages and photograph them in their lives and their homes. But I love the way Layla has done the post-production. It absolutely works. It's, you know, soft colours. She hasn't overdone it or anything. And this is all stuff which she kind of picked up along the way and did a beautiful job with. Um, another one of Layla's pictures, which I totally adore, which has a totally different treatment, is this one of this little girl in a field. The post-production is beautifully handled. It's about bringing about the feeling, the experience of, of you know, being in that heat and that haze and late afternoon. Look at the beautiful light on the girl. But the other thing to realize is about when you have dedicated some time to coming on a workshop, to being around this, you can fully immerse yourself. You haven't got somebody going, will you hurry up and take the blooming picture or any of that going on. So I don't know, but I'm going to, get, going to assert that Layla was probably watching this girl for quite some time, maybe had made some approach, being friendly and all the rest of it. Um, you know, and it's just waiting with the shot ready, with the aperture set so that you've got the shallow depth of field. She's in the right light, the exposure's ready, everything like that. And then it's just a case of watching and waiting. And then the girl turned around and it's just that moment when she touched her nose and that beautiful look in her face and click. These are all the sorts of things that we'll coach you on. Pat Millett. So lovely to see you on here, Pat. Um, Pat with a Hmong lady in uh, a village in Vietnam last year. Uh, we were having a great time and uh, she was out there with her husband, Robin, who... Uh, and it was great to have those guys. They're veterans. They've been along on several workshops. I think we first met on Lanzarote. I don't remember. By all means, comment in the chat because I don't remember where we met, but I know we've been seeing each other a lot over the years. 
Um, you know, and it's really interesting watching how Robin and Pat have grown over those years since we first met. Now, it's all about getting into action. You know, they do stuff. Okay, they come on workshops, but they also find the time and they get out and they go and shoot and they, and they have a great time. And they're lovely people. I want to share a quick picture here, which I totally love, that Robin took last year whilst on the workshop. Um, we were up by the side of the road. We'd come around a the corner, there's a bunch of people who were threshing rice, farmers threshing rice, and it was hot and all the rest of it. And it was really lovely. And myself, and I have to say most of us, uh, Bartosz, you were there as well. Um, we, we, we were shooting up by the road, and Robin took himself off on his own. And this is a good idea. Think differently, you know, go outside the box. Robin took himself off separately, and he went down an embankment and found this girl and the guy cutting rice. And... Again, I'm only asserting, I wasn't there. Rob, please, please say your story yourself in your own words. But, you know, he would have spent time with these people, got them used to him being there, interacted a little bit, you know, smiled and all the rest of it. And I think, with Simon and I both think, he absolutely nailed it with this. You know, it's so clear what's happening. The knife in the girl's hand, the sheaf of rice, the other guy cutting the rice, the mountains, that little hint of late afternoon colour in the sky. It's interesting, when uh, we were doing the post-production on some of these and we were looking at these pictures afterwards, Rob was tearing his hair out because he hated the lens flare in the top right corner. You remember that, Rob? Um, but actually, I, I love it. And I think you did too, didn't you, Simon? Yeah, yeah it was great. Yeah. Was yeah. It just kind of lends that atmosphere of warmth and heat and mist and steamy sort of goings on out in Vietnam. How am going to introduce you to somebody else here. This is Marie Caraban from France, who I did invite to come on. Unfortunately, she can't make it. She's in Portugal. She doesn't have a pretty good connection here. Marie's standing in a bullet cart, enjoying a nice, fresh coconut. One of the advantages of coming on these things. Now, when uh, Marie and I first met, uh, one of the first things she said to me was, how do you make that blur blurry background thing? How do you do blurry backgrounds? And, you know, now she's doing some amazing stuff and has been on several workshops. Here she is with Bartos in the background there, walking along the edge of a cliff in the mountains in Vietnam last year. Now, Marie is slightly bonkers. Where's my mouse gone? Marie is completely nuts. Here's a picture of her photographing some children on West Barai in Cambodia when she was out there with us. Now, although we all laugh and we all have a joke and we take the mickey and call her bonkers, why is she bending over photographing through her knees? Here's the thing, guys. There's nothing to frame a shot with there. And Marie was thinking to herself, I really kind of like this, but I want something soft and fuzzy, a bit of what Simon Taplin would call nonsense in the foreground, something really close to the lens that you can kind of knock a little bit out of focus. There wasn't really anything along the lake shore. So this is all about what we're always talking about, thinking differently, you know. We can coach and all the rest of it, but you guys also, when you're in that environment, when you're surrounded by other people, it helps get the thinking going. And Marie thought, okay, I want some nonsense. I want something really close to the lens. What did she do? She just bent over, shot with the camera upside down through her legs and just had a little bit of one of her legs in the corner of the shot, just all out of focus, close to the lens, which just kind of gave a little bit of something in the foreground. Whether it works or not, I don't know. Knowing Marie, she probably swore in French and then said, ah putain, and then just threw it away. But this is the thing. You're in this environment where you can try. You are free to do whatever you want and try things out and have a great laugh. So for somebody who asked me, how on earth do you make a blurry background? I just want to show you, here's one of Marie's shots, which I think is completely lovely with a blur, you know, a beautiful depth of field sandwich going on here. And again, the decisive moment, waiting for the buffalo to, to just raise its head and stare into the lens. Something Marie is very good at is uh, capturing the spirit and feeling of people who live in a place, especially children. She's always photographing the kids and interacting with them and laughing and having fun. This is Train Street in Hanoi, um, where we were last year. And, uh, you know, I was kind of interested, you may have seen a picture of mine, I was really interested in some, some local guys sitting outside a bar and I was waiting for this huge train to come along. Meanwhile, Marie just sat quietly somewhere and kind of interacted with, with two or three kids who were running in and out. Um, and I love this shot. I absolutely love it. Look at the light on that child's face. Look at the happiness. Uh, she had others as well where there's engagement. They're looking at her in the camera. But I really love the way this happy child is looking in through the doorway. Meanwhile, instead of a street outside, there's a great big railway line. I absolutely love the way it 
it brings this about. Something a lot of people ask about is what kind of fitness level do I need to come on a workshop? It varies workshop to workshop. Again, please guys who've been on them, by all means, leave some comments of your own. Just sort of let people know what you think. Um, in most cases, we've got transport laid on so that, you know, we can get as close to places as we need to. These are a couple of super jeeps that we, that we use in Iceland to get out onto the glaciers. So that if we're going onto a glacier, you know, we, some people will spend an awful lot of money to do a 10, 15, 20 kilometer hike out across the glacier. We hire some super jeeps so we can drive you out there. Um, but of course, there's going to be times when you do need to clamber down somewhere, to climb up on something. Photography is not about just standing in front of something and going click. It's about thinking where to stand, when to click. And I'm going to be introducing you to a guy who was really cool with that in a minute. So, you know, you may want to sort of climb down and get away from where everyone else is, where the Jeep's parked, because if you get down next to the lake and you line up a shot from there, you're going to get the picture that you want. You're going to portray it in your own way. You're cooking up those ingredients in your own way, in your own style. You know, this is a place you've probably seen lots of pictures of it. It's on Lanzarote. It's usually the first stop on the first day where we go and shoot sunrise. But again, you know, it's like, where are you going to go? You're going to stand on the wall. You're going to go down the other side of the wall and shoot across the, the you know, the water. Um, how are you going to go about things? So a degree of fitness and mobility, yes, it is needed. You do need to be able to move around, but do you need to do a super hike? No, not really. Um, Lanzarote, I would say, contains probably the, the most hiking of any of them. When we go up on top of a volcanic caldera out in one of the lava fields early in the morning, see if we can capture sunrise, but it's an amazing vantage point. Now to hike up here, I guess, hour, hour and a half's hike. It's not a hard hike, but it is an hour and a half of walking with some camera kit and some camera gear, you know, and yeah, it's a little bit steep, but it's not a difficult hike. There are also, of course, levels you can always sort of trail off along the way. Um, but when you get up there, the views are really quite, it's quite an amazing place to look at and to see and to look out across these lava fields and the volcanoes in the distance. Meanwhile, behind you, when you turn the other way, this is the Crater Rim, which you just saw the pictures of. Oh, dear. Who's it? I think. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. I can't remember your first name. I know that you're, you were there with H, weren't you? Um, and I think that's H in the background walking along behind. But. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely stunning when you turn around. This is the, the Crater Rim that um, we were walking along to get up there. But you know, a bit of a climb and a bit of a hike, a little bit of effort, it, it, it pays dividends. You can get some awesome shots. And if you're a little bit exhausted, you can of course do what our lovely friend Hassam did. <laughs> you can lie down in the sun and have a nice rest. I'm so glad you're here, Hassan. I'm so glad. Um, but you know, it's great. You're out there, you're having a cool time, you shoot some shots, you think, oh, I'm just gonna lie down in the sun for a minute. I wanna show you something quickly because I want to tell you a little bit about Hassan. Um, where have I put it? Here it is. Now something which he does a lot is Hassan is everywhere. He's everywhere. One minute he's standing on the wall photographing the sunrise in Lanzarote. Another time he will be up a tree. You look around, where's Hassan? Has anyone seen Hassan? Oh, there he is. He's over there, you know? He's disappeared. He's into the sea. And then everyone's going, Hassan, will you get out of our shot? We were on one of the workshops and uh, there was a guy who was struggling to, to kind of find angles and compositions. And Hassan kindly said, OK, well, look, I, why don't you come with me? No, why don't you come with me? So I kind of, well, they kind of paired up for a while because Hassan was everywhere, looking at everything from all sorts of different angles. And hey, my friend, look what I've got with me here. This is a book which Hassan made from his trip to Lanzarote. Now, something you need to know here. I think you said you'd only been doing photography for about a year or something when you first came to Lanzarote. You were still finding the way. But, you know, these are all things, this is the benefit of going on, on workshops as well, of getting stuck in and having an experience. Look at these beautiful pictures that Hassan took. And he made this lovely book, which he sent to me. Look at that, isn't that just awesome? I just love it. Um, 
to show you one more. I'm just going to flick some paint. There we go, look. There is that location where you just saw everyone on the wall there. And again, instead of standing on the wall, Hassan got down next to the water, shooting reflections. It's really good to have you here, Hassan. And I really hope our paths cross again sometime soon in the future. Where had I got to in my broadcast? I need to find where we were. We had Hassan having a kip. Here he is. Um, so... The next question, which you know comes up a lot, is just what will it be like? You know, what's the weather like? What's the landscape like? What do I need to bring? What do I need to wear? Well, of course, each is different, and we will always, um, you know, give you instructions, tell you what you need to bring. You don't need to bring tons and tons of stuff because it's just hard work. But you know, yeah, things are changeable, and again, it depends where you go. Somewhere like Lanzarote, the weather's pretty stable. It's generally pretty nice most days. You know, you got sunniness and warmth. Sometimes you get um, stuff coming in from the Sahara, which kind of turns the sky a bit grey. But generally speaking, it's completely lovely. Um, it's pretty stable. Whereas you go somewhere like Iceland. <laughs> it's changeable it changes every few seconds sometimes uh we were shooting somewhere and an ice storm just blew in you know and i think this is jody and i think it's freddie from brazil there i'm not entirely certain but i think it might be freddie yeah i'm sure that's jody and freddie you know but it's like again don't run away from it shooting it what's it like to be in an ice storm see if you can shoot something like that see if you can capture that feeling um you know, your camera's pretty robust. Stop worrying about your camera getting damaged. Yeah, a little bit of water's not going to hurt it, you know. Yeah, dunk it in the sea. That's not a good idea. But then, you know, the weather will change and you can find yourself standing in some of the most amazingly beautiful scenery. Just in itself, that can be worth being there. Just to stand and experience. One of the first times I shot the Northern Lights, we'd had an amazing, amazing display and you know we were all running around and i've been shooting and shooting in different angles and just taking shots and after i just thought you know what just put the camera down for a minute and experience this this incredible thing these colors this amazing thing in the sky and if it wasn't there we'd all be dead we'd all be fried and it was just incredible i just lay on my back on this black sand beach and just stared up at the sky and just watched the northern lights for a minute it's you know yeah sure there's photography and all the excitement of doing that um, what's it like? Yeah, I'm, again, I'm in Iceland. So, you know, it's a pretty rugged and wild place, but it's exciting. Thor and I know what we're doing. We'll look after you. We'll take care of you. Um, there's always safety things and we always make sure we watch people's backs. Now, for example, technique as well. Thinking outside the box, there's some unique techniques. This is Jody on the ice beach. Jody came out from Australia. She's a very good photographer, but she mostly photographs jewellery. She designs and sells beautiful jewellery with opals comes from the Kimberley um, but she'd never done landscape photography and so she came on this workshop with us and uh, I remember on the first day we were somewhere and we were looking at this glacier and it's all beautiful and uh, we shot a couple of pictures Jodie took a shot and she goes yeah well it's all right she said but it's I don't know it's missing something it's not quite working what what do we need to do here and either Thor or myself I don't remember who so I said well look you know here you go if you move back a bit you can have a bit of foreground here and if you, you you move this way but you can include a little bit of the cloud up there in the sky and you're starting to sort of frame up what's going on with the glacier and Jodie retook her shot and she looked at it and she said Oh, yeah, that's much better, she said. So the moral of the story is, if you want a good photo, just put plenty of shit in the corners. And that became the mantra for the workshop everywhere we went. It's like, so what do we do, guys? Plenty of shit in the corners. So, you know, we do have a laugh. We do have a crack. But there's a whole technique to what Jodie's doing there. She wanted to capture that moment when a wave hit the back of the iceberg sitting there on the beach, that moment when the water goes poof out and sprays out like this now look at that there's a wave coming in thing is there going to be time to fiddle about with focus and exposure and shutter speed and get the composition level you know are you going to have time to do that how long has she got between that that wave hitting the iceberg and the wave hitting her 
not very long. So there is a technique involved in being able to shoot that and make it work. And she absolutely did. Unfortunately, I don't have the shot she took there to show you at the moment, but you know, we helped her with that, how to do it, how to pre-focus, how to pre-expose, how to set the shot up so you haven't even got to touch or look through the camera so that you can run down, the water goes back, you run down, camera on the beach with the tripod, cable release, bang, 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 got your shot, get it up, get back before the wave gets you. And also, of course, as you can see, I took that picture, I was stood nearby because, you know, we always make sure we're stood nearby, everybody's safe, we're watching your back. And of course, as I just said, training on location, Thor and uh, Brian here on the ice beach, going through some techniques for making these sorts of shots really rock. Weather plays a big part in photography. Don't be afraid of weather, whether you're here or on a workshop or abroad, because weather plays a part. This was at one of the ice lagoons. Um, and yeah, it's getting a bit later in the day and we said, come on, we need to sort of make tracks. And Thor took the top path around the lagoon, just sort of, hey guys, come on, head back to the bus. We need to sort of start moving now. And I, I took the lower path by the water um, just to make sure, you know, everyone's back in the bus, everyone's all okay. And as we walked up the rise, there's our bus stood there and there was a, the wind had gusted and there was snow blowing through the headlights and uh, Mohammed Mirza there was stood next to the bus just sort of like having a break waiting for everyone to show up and I'm like I grabbed the camera I really wanted to get this shot and, and Mohammed don't move I need you there that storm front coming in behind the bus it's just so exciting and exhilarating um, yeah, unfortunately I had to use the tripod. The light was so low that I could not hand hold that shot, particularly not in a buffety wind which was going on. But of course the snow I really wanted through the headlights and just Mohammed sort of stood above this sort of waist level gust of snowiness. It, I missed it, but it's still a nice shot. You may have seen this one again. It's a weather shot. Um, it was raining, but I just love it. It's that whole hot, humid Asia, you know, rainy thing. Don't be afraid of stuff like that you know we will teach you how to shoot the weather if you like this is all part of the experience of being somewhere this is one of Jen Scoopman's pictures uh, thank you Jens for sending it to me um, again shooting the northern lights there is a whole load of stuff and preparation which which has to be gone into so a lot of research goes into these things the northern lights are caused by uh, radioactive particles discharged by the sun. There'll be a solar storm, whatever it is, blasts a load of radioactive particles out into space and they come streaming across towards our little planet Earth. As they hit the planet's magnetosphere, some of these particles are pulled in at the poles, north and south poles. When they come in the north pole, it's the northern lights. As these particles come down through the atmosphere, they cool down and they start to give off colours according to which element they are. For example, you know, copper is blue and, and all this sort of stuff. But when you're going to photograph something like that, what are you going to do? You're just going to take a picture of the northern lights in the sky. That's a bit like just taking a picture of a sunset, you know? Yeah, sometimes it works. But it's always better to shoot a picture with the northern lights in it or with the sunset in it. So we will teach you how to research locations if you're into landscape. For example, we knew from research that this particular night we got a good break in the weather, should have clear skies, there'd been solar activity a couple of days before we were due for a good old northern lights. Where are we going to go and photograph them? Come on guys, in the bus, let's go find, let's go researching locations, let's find stuff that's going to work instead of running around like headless chickens going, oh northern lights, quick, what are we going to do? So we had a drive round, we found two or three of these, these little lakes, these little pools, and just sort of like had a walk around them. You know, which side of the lake do we need to be to face north? They're called the Northern Lights for a reason. There's a thing called a KP number, which will tell you how the higher that number, the further south they'll come. But generally speaking, let's say we're going to face north. So we go to the south side of the lake and this little pool, and we're walking around and figuring out angles and where to shoot from. So that when we go back at night, and we may have to wait a little while, we're not going to be running around like headless chickens. You know where to go. You know what shot you want. And um, there's the shot I took of that same spot that very night. Um, because we'd done the research, we knew where to go. We knew what to do. These are all other things you get from being on a workshop is, is you know, I and my partners will, will teach you how to research things. Also, you get to have some little adventures. Here we are in the village of Kampong Pluk in Cambodia. Now, we go here fairly regularly. It's a great place to photograph local life. 
Now, most years, we, we, well, we do every year, arrange the workshops so that it fits between monsoon and hot season. So that, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. The temperature's not too hot. It's not super wet. Monsoon came late this year and we get to camp on pluck. And this is usually a dusty street. And of course, it's full of water. Now, that's not a disaster for the locals. That's not a problem. That's not unusual. It's just the way it is, you know. And when the monsoon comes and the water level rises from the lake, the mopeds go upstairs on these balconies of the houses and out come the boats and everyone just starts moving around on the water and it's really cool. So we get there and instead of being able to walk down the street, um, you know, in no time at all, Darlene, our, our local fixer, had sort of sorted it out and got some boats and we'd hired them and everybody's in the boat and off we go shooting some pictures and it was absolutely an amazing experience. It was fantastic. Um, you know, it's a little bit of no pain, no gain, you know. We have to just kind of step out just a little bit. I love these sunsets in Iceland. This was recently, That was this was this year. But, you know, it was windy. It was very windy, you know. Step out of that comfort zone just a little bit. Nothing's going to happen to you. You'll be fine. It was really windy. Um, you know, and you're kind of like hunched a bit against the wind. There's a bit of sand flying around. But again, by walking around, we show you how to find places, where to stand and all this sort of thing. And then when the decisive moments happen, like suddenly the clouds breaking and a, a storm coming in, you're in the right place. You know what to do. You're there. You're ready. And uh, it's absolutely amazing. And finally, I think this is you, Dave Poxon. Though it could have been Freddie. I'm not sure. Uh, one of the waterfalls that... Uh, one of you guys I know, but is he the Dave or Freddie? I know they're up the front there and they wanted to get some close-up action of the water cascading down this, this waterfall. Um, and again, there's a trick. How do you do that without your lens being instantly covered in droplets? You know, these are all the sorts of things we'll go through and show you and teach you how to do. Little, little tricks that will make things work for you. So, I mean, there's only really one more thing I want to talk to you about and then I'm going to do my best to answer your questions. So, Melissa, if you've got some stored up, by all means, send them over to me, please. Um, but also, one of the main things which people say is, you know, I don't want to go on my own. I'm looking for a partner to come with me. I'm trying to talk my friend into coming or something like that. And I get it. Yeah, it's great to share these things with a friend. But I also want to just reassure you that the group bonds really, really quickly. If you think about it, you know, what are the common interests there? What are the common theme? Everybody loves photography. Everybody wants to learn. Everybody wants to get the best out of what they can do and have an amazing experience and go home with some stories to share and, and things to show people. But also, there's a common theme and that's me. If you've been following my videos, you watch my stuff and you like it, then you've got something in common. It, chances are your sense of humour is going to be about the same, isn't it? You're going to be the same sort of a person, really. Um, so your common theme is me. If you're someone who thinks, I can't stand that brown bloke, God, he's a tosser. Well, you know, you're not going to come, are you? So that's completely cool. It's just one of those things. Um, another little concern some people have is about language barriers in, in foreign countries. Most places people speak English. Um, and if they don't, it doesn't really matter because, you know, Simon, myself, Thor, we're around, you know, we make sure stuff happens. Um, it really isn't a problem. And also, it's actually really good fun miming to people because if you want to have a go at photographing someone, there's no better way to break the ice than to make contact with them, you know? Uh, like, you know? You've just said, can I take your picture? And the chances are they'll get it. And if they don't want you to, they'll go, it's not a problem. Uh, I once mimed, please can I have a boiled egg somewhere or other? And, uh, I'm not going to do it here. But anyway, it worked and it broke the ice and it gave people something to laugh at. Food, that's another one, you know, particularly in Asia, I know there's concerns about food. Um, it's fine, you know, it's all edible. You don't have to have spicy food. In Iceland, you don't have to eat the ghastly rank fermented shark, which Thor will try and feed you. Um, some people like it. His son does. So does he. Weirdos. But anyway, there are normal things to eat as well and delicious, wonderful things to eat as well. And the other one which people are sometimes concerned about is medical stuff. And I just want to share a story about um, a really lovely lady who is a Canadian. She lives in Canada. I'm not going to share your name just in case. You may be on this chat. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, if you are, by all means, sing out. 
that was me. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, she wanted to come out to Cambodia with us. And I confess, I was nervous. She told me she got a lot of allergies, so a lot of medical problems with this. And yeah, there was some concerns and, you know, we had a chat on the phone about it because let's face it, we can't absolutely guarantee certain things in countries like Vietnam. Um, and she just said, look, I've lived with this stuff my entire life. I know what's going on. I can take some stuff with me and all the rest of it. And, you know, I just thought that's really brave. And she did. And she had a brilliant time. We had a lovely time shooting together. And uh, that same lady has since been to Iceland and other places. If anything ever happens, of course there's hospitals, of course there's medical facilities, you know, that's what we're there for. That's why we have air-conditioned transport and, you know, we, we are always within reach of something if anybody needs anything. So I'm pretty much come to the end of my spiel here. Um, I'm going to have a little look into the live chat place, if I can find it. I've got so many things on my laptop. Christina's... Christina Simon? Yes, the, the panning shot. <laughs> ah, Christina's panning shot. Oh, I wish I had that here, Christina. Um, I really do wish I had that here. I need to tell you that story, though, because uh, as a bunch of us, I think it may have been in Camp on Pluck or somewhere like that. I don't remember where it was, but uh, it said, hey, any of you guys want to come and have a go at panning, you know, getting that movement pan shot? And we were going down. We found a little street. Um, and Christina was stood next to me. I said, yeah. So I went through the, the technique of, you know, so this is kind of what you need to do. Um, you want to pan and slow shutter speed and you find it out. I, I don't know what it was now. There's a, there's a little tuk-tuk coming. There's, I don't know, a pile of people carrying donkeys on the back of a pony on the being towed by a handcart or something. And Christina just sort of lined up a shot and just sort of went, click. What, like that? It's one of the best panning shots I've ever seen, and I've never forgiven you for that, Christina. <laughs> it was absolutely awesome. I just left it to it. But, you know, we have fun with these things. Iglo, how lovely to see you there. Iglo from Iceland. You were on Lanzarote with us. How cool. I'm sorry, Michael Wright. Hey, Rob. Hey, Michael Wright. Sorry. Oh, guys, thank you so much for joining in. I just saw Hussam say Johnny Bakes is one of my favourite bakeries. Yes, if you ever come to Lanzarote, you are coming to the best bakery in the world, bar none, when we go to Johnny Bakes for breakfast. So, um, Melissa, I don't know if you've sent me any questions. I'm going to go and have a little look in, in my Slack thing. This is just awesome. Hey, James Fisher. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. I hope you're well. I mustn't get... Uh, caught up in talking to my old buddies here but it would be so nice to do that um t5 jet how long is a workshop please workshops vary have a look on the website they vary <clears throat> the master class i do in switzerland is just two days it's a day of classroom based stuff with lots of activities where you run outside and shoot things it's by a beautiful lake with mountains and snow-capped peaks you've got really good stuff to practice with and then the following day is a photo, work in, photo walk in Zurich itself, uh, where there is a spring parade, there's stuff going on, street performers usually, so you get a great opportunity to practice what you did the day before. Others last longer. We've done them in Iceland for 10 days. Go and have a look on my website in the workshop section. There are links below this live stream in the description box, um, which you can click to go and have a look at, at, at pictures and images and things. By the way, something I didn't address, sorry, in, in the live, uh, in just now was was kit a lot of people worry that their equipment isn't professional enough really 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 don't panic you don't necessarily need top-end professional kit many people don't bring professional kit there's a lady came to Iceland um, lovely lady called Abby um, yeah she was really really at the beginning of her journey but she had some great ideas and we were able to help her bring them to life she's just using a basic camera and look almost everything I shoot is of course with I can't see what's going on because I've got my something covering my... There we go. Almost everything I shoot is, of course, with my little Fuji X-T2 with the 18-55. to If you want to go and see a bunch of pictures taken with that, there's a link below. It's just uh, my pictures and there's a gallery. Almost everything in there was taken with the 18-55. to um, Right, April Hol Holkenif. Someone is new to photography and wants to come to a workshop. What lens should I need to bring? Well, there we go. I kind of answered it. The only lens I take is my bog standard 18 to 55. If you've got something of a greater range and if you're new to photography, you don't need loads of things. But, you know, let's say you've got a, 
18 to 200 super zoom, you're fine, but I shoot almost everything on my 18 to 55 bog standard lens. Um, I need to tell you a story last year in Vietnam. I was watching Simon Taplin, who's sitting opposite me here, walking up a hill, and he's looking at me, sneaky, uh, walking up a hill in Vietnam. And I said, hey, mate, I just noticed you're shooting everything on a 70 to 200 mil lens. You know, you're doing like a personal photo challenge. He just said, no, he said, I've lost the other one, so I'm just using this. <laughs> Is that not true? Yeah, that was true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Work with what you have. Work with what you have, absolutely. Don't worry about the kit. It's the photographer that's important. Glenn Haskinshaw show, how much does it cost? Again, it depends workshop to workshop. Please click on a link below to the workshops. Go and have a look. You can see how much workshops cost. Of course, if you're going somewhere like Iceland or the other side, you know, around, around to Asia, there are more costs involved because we've got to do ho lots of hotels and transport and insurances and things like that. You know, and Iceland's not a cheap country. Uh, if you're coming down on the one day beginners workshop near where I live, it's 135 quid for the day. You know, it, it varies. Abhishek, good to see you, sir. I think it's our insecurities that stop us from going for such a workshop, but the actual experience is thrilling and totally satisfying. Well, thank you. Um, I think you've been on a workshop, haven't you, Abhishek? I'm pretty sure you have. Forgive me, it's so difficult to keep track. Do you know what? I looked in our list and there are hundreds of people who've been on workshops now. Um, but I know your name and, and I know we've met. Christopher... Coleman, evening Mike, is it true that you can't record the Northern Lights with a digital camera? Well, I think you just saw my picture of the Northern Lights, Christopher. Uh, absolute, complete and utter bullshit. I don't know where you heard that one. Um, probably another internet myth. Uh, yeah, we shoot the Northern Lights with uh, digital cameras all the time. Again, go and have a look at the link, my pictures, go and have a scroll through my stuff because you will find loads of Northern Light pictures all taken digitally. Something you might like to mention is, is is peer learning, which I find is good you know, point. Sitting down and discussing other the pictures is learning from one another, not just instructors. Absolutely, you just heard Simon interject there. Yeah, there's peer to peer learning. Uh, again, it's like when you see what someone else has done, but also when you're looking at something and, and you're sort of like, oh, you know, you might say, oh, I don't know how to approach this, and, and someone else say, well, I don't know, how about this? And, and, and you in little. The same place at the same time, and you see something completely different. You said, well, I didn't see that. Absolutely, yeah, you know, this is it. It's peer to peer learning is very valuable. Uh, wherever we can on workshops, we, we also make sure that uh, there is time whenever possible to look at pictures to share our top five from each day so that each of us can see what someone else would made with the same ingredients you know and you look over and you go we're like, like i mentioned uh, our lovely friend hassan you know hassan what the hell are you doing up a tree over there and then when you look at the pic you go oh i see what you're doing up a tree all good learning all good learning juice um christy schmidt I'll eat shark. I just want to know what clothing I will need for Iceland. Ladies, please help. Well, I'm actually a rough beard wearing, trouser wearing, grr, grizzly man. But again, it's all there. If you sign up for the workshop, in fact, if you go and look at the itinerary, it, we, we tell you what to bring, what you need. It's not as cold as you think. It really isn't. As I said, Vanessa comes over from um, Canada just to warm up because, uh, you know, but of course it depends where in the world you live. A couple of guys from the Emirates were with us in Iceland, absolutely freezing their plums off, you know, whereas Vanessa was stripping layers off, you know, I think she's going to go moon bathing. Um, yeah, Melissa, by all means, ping me a few more questions through, unless you've got any there, Simon. No, I think I've covered them. Oh, this is so great. Hey, uh, uh, I think it's great that Bartos. everyone's interacting. And this is really cool. I'm just looking at some of this stuff coming through. Um, on the chat, I've just managed to see some of it, and this is really cool. Try lying down, looking up, can give you some awesome pictures. Very true, Vic Stokes, absolutely. Um, you know, there's some amazing stuff going on. Guys, if you've got any more questions, please feed them through to, you know, in there, and, and I'll get them, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, we've probably got maybe another five or 10 minutes, and then it's probably time to call it a night. What life-changing moments and lessons have I had on these workshops from Lyle Gonzalez? Good one, Lyle. Um, all sorts. I've had some really, really humbling experiences along the way, some exciting moments, some educational moments. Um, for me, one of the most 
uh, life changing, I guess, was was uh, meeting a guy who we work with in Cambodia, who always comes along, and gives us a hand, called Soon Ratana. He's one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. He was um, he's been through some. I don't want to go into it here, but he's been through some pretty horrific stuff in his life. There is not an ounce of pathos, and his entire life is dedicated to telling his story, because it's all involved with some really quite nasty things that happen politically, and his belief is that. We will never fight terrorism. We can only educate people out of it. And that takes time. And people who've been involved in, in horrific things sharing their stories. Uh, he's great fun. He's an amazing guy. And the first thing he did when I met him was uh, he offered me a cigarette. And he said, um, no, he didn't. The first thing he said was, I steal things. And then he offered me a cigarette a bit later. I said, no, thanks. I got my own. I rolled myself a cigarette. And I... then he lit it with my lighter. And he's just showing you how they were trained as children to steal things. It's amazing. Ridder Van Dorn, hello Mike, hello Ridder. Do you teach photography marketing too? No, that's not one that I go into, I'm afraid. Um, marketing photography for businesses like marketing anything, there are, there are paths to market, but I'm sorry, it's not one that we go into, certainly not on workshops. Um, as for the clothing, I didn't really finish, did I, Christy? I'm sorry, yeah, we will tell you, don't worry, you don't need a great deal of stuff. I take one small, very small handbag, with, not, not handbag, you know, handbag. Uh, suitcase is the word, with a handful of clothes. It's all you need for the week. Um, Martin Conrad, did you ever figure out what happened to the camera you lost? Yes, somebody else has got it. <laughs> I'm sure it didn't get smashed. There were no bits of plastic lying on the ground. But, um, yeah, I think somebody walked along and went, oh, look, I'll have that. So it's a shame, lesson learned. T5 Jet, what's involved on a one-to-one -one day? Whatever you want to be involved on a one-to-one -one day, um, if you're thinking of coming on one, it is, I think, very good value because everything is relative to you. Uh, that is something you get on a workshop, of course, because the student-teacher ratio is low. So, you know, we have time to spend individually with every single person on a workshop. Um, yeah, one-to-one -one day. It's whatever you want to work on. It's whatever you need to do, whether that's learning about settings and controls, light, whatever it is. You know, it's like if you want to do one, we have a chat about what you want to do, book it in. We rock it and we go and do it. So I think we've probably come to the end of questions. Um, someone asked why Iceland is the longest. I'm sorry, I don't know who it was who asked that. Iceland isn't necessarily always the longest. Sometimes we've done them in Asia for longer. Um, but you know, in Iceland, there's a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot of places to go. Um, Russell, yeah, I remember you, Russell. Sorry, Russell Hawker. Hello, Mike. Did a workshop with you in 2015. Had a fantastic time. Must do another. I remember you, Russell. I'm pretty sure that was Zurich. I'm pretty sure you came to Zurich. Just, uh, yeah. Give me a thumbs up if I got that right. Um, is there anything else? Mike, do you recommend London or Scotland for shooting? I'm planning a trip. Oh, it depends what you like to shoot. If you like landscapes and, and wild mountains, then you're not going to find any of those in London. I... I can't tell you. I like shooting. I like photographing life and people and what's going on in the world. So, um, yeah. If you like street photography, London's a good place. Architecture, London's a good place. But then you've also got Edinburgh and, and Glasgow in Scotland. Um, go on Google Images. Have a look at pictures of these places and see if there's things you like. Um, I think we've lost Melissa. Melissa was feeding me through your questions, but I know she said she had an internet problem. Uh, she's currently in Cambodia getting some groundwork done ready for the workshop we're coming over to do, but I haven't seen anything from Melissa for a long time, so uh, I don't know if you're there, Foxy. Um, someone, yeah. Someone mentioned what happens if uh, some of your equipment breaks on a workshop. What happens if some of your equipment... Thanks, yeah. Simon. Uh, you know, sharing. You know, yeah. Uh, what happens if some equipment breaks on a workshop? Well... These things happen, uh, but usually we can share, you know, I've usually got a spare camera. We, we will figure a way around. These things do happen. Somebody lost, you know, a couple of people I've seen lose cameras uh, on workshops or, or things get damaged. There's a wonderful guy came along um, to Iceland this year, John. John, I can't remember your surname. He's one of the most calm people I've ever met. Uh, We'd been hanging out for an hour or two on, on the first evening at the welcome dinner where we sort of introduced people to, to what's going on. And uh, 
he just sort of said, this is going to be an interesting workshop because I haven't got a camera with me. And we're like, what? You've come all the way from, you know, the United States to Iceland and you haven't got a camera with you. His camera and all his equipment was stolen somewhere in an airport where he was changing flights, you know, and he's the calmest man I've ever met. I wouldn't have been that calm. I'd have been tearing my hair out and trying to find a shop immediately. But, you know, it's not a problem. I had a spare camera and some lenses uh, in my bag, which I don't usually use. So I just, again, just sort of, I gave him my spare, my Fuji X-T1 and some lenses, and I just used my little X-T like this. And if I needed, there's always a way around it, don't worry. Um, hey, Sheila Slade, good to see you. I can see you're uh, uh, responding to comments too, thank you. Yeah, James, I remember Tim borrowing your spare Canon battery. Um, <laughs> this is just amazing. Oh, hang on. Have we got Melissa back? We have. We got something here. How about a street photo trip? Yeah, I'd be really interested in that, James. James Fisher. Um, I'd quite like to do that. Although, to be honest with you, I would be unlikely to want to run a street photography workshop in the UK currently. It's, it's just a little bit more hard work. It's quite hardcore street photography in the UK. Um, I don't really have a problem with doing it, but it is quite hardcore. Um, we don't know. We have a very paranoid society here in the UK um, about having their pictures taken. It's getting worse and worse and worse, actually, throughout the West. Street photography workshops in Asia, well, we don't need to do a street photography workshop in Asia because when we're doing them in Asia, there's tons of it because it's going on around you all the time. It's so easy, like uh, Christina Simon with her awesome pan blur shot. You know, we just stood by the side of a road. The biggest problem you have sometimes in Asia is, is if people see you going to take their picture, they will often go like that and pose for you or do something. And we don't want them to. We just want them to be calm. But street photography is really, really simple there. OK, what do we got? Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Melissa. A couple more. Darren Tisdale, what's in your bag when you do workshops? Laptop, charger, a couple of small external hard drives because I only work on externals and I also always want to have a backup. Um, my X-T2, my 18-55, to 55, and sometimes I've got a wide angle, you know, 10 to 20 and a 55-200. And a to 200. But it's, and they're nearly always in the hotel room. I hardly ever take them out. About the only thing I take with me when shooting on a workshop is I just dangle that on my wrist like that and use that. It's pretty rare. Iceland, sometimes you need a wide angle lens if you want to do some sort of cool, you know, depth stuff with icebergs and things. But for the most part, I'm just using my little 18 to 55. George Munro, how do you get intimate shots of people, strangers when in Asia? You just walk up to them and take a picture. Simon, come and talk. Simon. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, what? Yeah, no, it's okay. I was monitoring questions. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Come back to it. I, I, want, I want Simon to come and join me on this because, look, can we see you? Get close. You're going to have to cuddle up, mate. Oh, oh. Uh, don't break things. Okay. <laughs> now, Simon has lived and shot in Asia as a stock. I'm going to hold it. Okay. I don't trust you. Um, Simon, talk about street photography in Asia. Um, well, it, it's, I was just look, sorry, I was just looking at comments and everyone's saying, you know, it's impossible in Spain, it's impossible in France, it, it, it is, it's just privacy all over the world, it's completely changed photography and um, Asia, no one has a problem with it, it's, uh, it's fine, people are welcoming, people don't have this fear of, you know, how their picture's going to be, you know, misused or used or, no. or how, and I, I've never had once... Well, maybe maybe once I've had somebody just just gently put their hand up, um, but for 17 years, I no one no one no one's ever stopped me. I mean, uh, so I mean, also like what Simon's not saying there, because he's a very modest guy. But Simon's a commissioned stock photographer for Getty Images. You know, they'd issue him with a great big long list of pictures they wanted, and it was all lifestyle stuff you did. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. just used to shoot it on the streets. You weren't hiring models. No, 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 no. We were hiring models. Oh, because ev ev models. everyone has to be model released. Of course, everyone yes. has sorry, to give sorry. a permission to use wrong. pictures. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So no, they, they were all model released. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yeah, Simon's been shooting on the streets for a very, very long time. Um, just see if there's any more questions. We're kind of coming to wrap it up time, I think, guys. I'm loving the fact that all this conversation is going on in the chat chat yes Bartos you had a great time Asia was great for taking pictures of people that's where I learned it yeah I mean we had an absolute blast there 
Oh no, Eaglo in Iceland just said KP5 tonight in Iceland. That means there's going to be a mother of a Northern Lights. I am jealous. Um, have we got any more questions here from anyone? From Melissa, ready to go. David, George Munro, how do you get intimate shots? Oh, we've done that one. Sorry, David Clary. How do you get people? Do you get people say no to you when you photograph them? And if they say no, does your spirit go down? <coughs> and how do you go about rejection? Um, Not really. It's you just no, move on. You, just, you know, it's you fair enough. If someone on, doesn't want know? the picture taken, but it's uh, it's also how you approach taking. I think you touched on that earlier. Absolutely. It's about you. You. Someone has to let themselves into their space. I think it was Sebastian Salgado said, there's a famous quote, he said, you know, you can take the best picture in the world, but someone has to give you themselves for that precise moment in time. Mm. And, and that's how you approach mm. people. And if, if you just run up to somebody and, and well, there's, there is this genre of street photography, we were talking about it earlier, where Ugly. people just run up to people and just shock a reaction I'm, I'm, I'm really not into I'm that I'm totally against it I, I think it's, it's intrusive you know, I think it's rude I think yeah. it's, it's, it's <clears throat> trying to provoke an unpleasant reaction for shock tactics and I don't like yeah, it but yeah. so people have know. to let themselves into, into their space and they give themselves to you for that specific moment and you'll know if, if they're not comfortable then you just move on absolutely. You know, it's, uh, there's plenty of pictures to be had yeah absolutely and again you know, um, please go and click um David, go click click on the link through to my pictures underneath in 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 the you know the description bit when we finished because or you may have to come back when it's archived because there's loads of people pictures in Asia there and really 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 nobody nobody cares but if you do get rejected and this has happened I, I've shot things on the street and people have gone oh what are you doing with my picture you know you just go all right mate sorry walk yeah. away you know don't don't let things crush you don't let things crush your spirit. All they're doing is saying no. That's all. It means nothing about you. It doesn't mean you're bad, wicked, or wrong. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It just means that they don't like yeah. it. And you just go, yeah, okay, fair enough, mate. I mean, sometimes I think it's quite good fun. I quite like chat. When I have done some street photography in London, I love the way security guards outside go, you're not allowed to photograph our building. You might be. Because have you ever heard of Google Street View, mate? I can look in the windows without photographing yeah. your bin or yeah. building. I photographed a security guard once as he was bollocking me. I thought that was quite good fun. I'm really upset. Yeah. Um, what have we got? Yeah. Alan Tidley. Uh, where do you put all your photos? Do you still print or sell? Mm. Good question. So personally, I'll go and then you go, if you like. Um, go on, you go. Selling your photos? Do you, no, do, what do you do with your photos? Um, I print no no I, I print them up and and I, I give them to family members I give them to friends sometimes you know people I, I like that print and, and I, I buy it I, I put a lot of my pictures on Getty images and uh, well Getty images now because Corbus has been bought over by Getty um, but yeah I'll sell some of my travel pictures on on, on Getty images um, so uh, that's mostly where they go Apologies, guys. I just had a message from Emma saying that the sound's not so good because I've been holding it between us. I need to do this thing. Um, yeah, and for myself, I'm quite embarrassed to say, well, I've got loads of pictures. Again, click the link, go and have a look at them. What do I do with them? Um, a plan which we've had for a long time and haven't had the time to implement yet. I want to start putting together my images shot on workshops almost exclusively again with an 18 to 55 lens, the one which people say, you know, oh, I need a better lens. No, you don't. Um, I want to create, start creating a book. The idea is probably call it Bare Lens 1855, no filters and 1855 lens. I want to start publishing a book of images that I've shot like that and then selling it online uh, to raise money for some of the poorer communities that we, we photograph and work with in Asia because we're both very, very against poverty tourism. But very often the poorest people in the world um, give us some of the most amazing pictures um like this for example the Hmong tribe you know the Hmong people living in the mountains in vietnam they haven't got a lot of money now, these guys are pretty self-sufficient and and probably quite happy but there are places in the world where it's not like that and uh, we believe in putting something back wherever possible. So I want to start putting my images out online, maybe selling them through, I think it's Etsy's and, and other places. Uh, and any revenue generated from those images will go directly into organisations such as Mekong Plus and others that we work with already. 
to try and put a little bit back in the into the world you know but these poor people are sharing everything with us and i think we well we do put something back already but well, of course our workshops are all sustainable so every every workshop we do we support the community we use local tuk-tuk drivers um, we support villages uh, <coughs> and, and then uh, monasteries we donate rice um, so all our workshops are sustainable so not only are you coming on a great workshop but by being there you're actually contributing back to the community yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I should point out at this stage that is only the Asia workshops. Um, but, you know, it's something we want to build in as time goes on. There's so many things to do. Thank you. I'm just seeing a lot of comments coming in saying I'd love to buy that book. Well, thank you very much. Valerie Hollifield, my favourite lens is the 18-55. to Rock on. Rock on, Valerie. You're absolutely right. I think we've come to wrap up time, guys. I think it's probably time to say night-night. Um... And thank you very, very much for joining us here. It's been an absolute privilege to talk to you and uh, to have yeah, a chat with it's you. It's great. Thank you for everyone that's been on our workshops, which have helped contribute to the questions and answers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you guys who've been on workshops, we've seen so many of your comments coming through. Um, I'm sorry I haven't mentioned all of you. Uh, I haven't been able to look at that and look at the software I have to use to run the live stream so we can change pictures. But thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart for coming on here and sharing your experiences with other people and, and helping us out there. Um, and thank you to everybody who's come on here to find out a little bit more about it. So I hope we've answered your questions about what it's like to be on a workshop. I know many, many people have said, you know, oh, I'd love to do that, but... It's very easy to put a butt in the way. I know there are costs. I know there are all these things. But, you know, maybe if you don't buy five new lenses in the next two years, you could go and learn how to do it and have an astonishing experience and come home with some absolute rock and roll pictures and stories to share with your families and friends, you know? I mean... I could go on for hours about this. Robin, yeah. Robin, you're, you're, you're waffling, Brown. I am. I'm sorry. I'm really passionate about it. And I feel so sad that you guys are missing out on things. Right. I'm going to shut up. Thank you for being here. I'm going to say good night and take care. And we'll catch you next time. Good night.